welcome and uh, thank you everybody for taking the time out to attend today's webinar. Um, so just a couple of brief introductions really before we get into the, the detail and some of the incredible insight that's been prepared here by both uh, Weetabix and by Mills and Reeves. So, uh, so I'm, I'm Mark, I, I head up commercial for the One Group and this is now, I guess now we're approaching nearly a year of moving our events strategy and um, uh, portfolio onto online format with webinars. So, of course, we've had uh, COVID that's probably uh, enhanced this, but actually, do you know what, now we've started doing them more frequently, it's a really good way for us to get um, uh, a good message out there to people that people are really wanting to still hear about. And I think really testament to the subject of diversity and inclusion and the amount of people that we've had registered on today's webinar. So. I couldn't be more grateful to both Danny and to Tash for putting together the content they have done and the time spent on doing so, uh, because it's uh, it's really it's, it's incredible. Actually, it's a really um, it's really quite uh, it's taken us back really as to how much people still want to know about these topics, which are clearly really really important. So, so our um, our event strategy has spanned from lots of different uh, subjects. You know, we helped uh, sort of add some information here about furlough and the job retention scheme. We've done well being which we had um, uh, sort of two webinars ago where we had Monday Farmer talking about their wellbeing strategy during this time. And we wanna continue doing these types of things. So, but really we wanna shape it around the audience and that's everybody here today. So there will be feedback that's sent after this and we're really keen to make sure that we're providing information here and putting together content that is, is usable, is needed, and actually is gonna be, um, is gonna be stuff that adds value to everybody that, uh, that attends. So. Looks like the room's filled up well. So just a bit of housekeeping so everybody does know. Um, so we've um, uh, so we, we've got a Q&A function here as well. So if people could focus on the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function, if they have any questions. So um, we'll have both speakers. So when I've introduced Danny, Danny will do his discussion uh, and then we'll introduce uh, Tash and she'll do her part of, uh, of today's webinar. And then at the end, we'll uh, get together, we'll have time for a Q&A. We have got some questions that people have taken the time to ask before the webinar started and upon their registration. So we'll go through those. And then at that stage, when people have some more questions that have come from the content today, yeah, please, by all means, um, yeah, start to ask the panel later on and we'll get through to that. I would certainly say today's webinar will be approximately 50 minutes to an hour in length. So, uh, so again, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, and I guess without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Danny Singh uh, from Weetabix. So seamlessly, there we go. Um, so. I just check you can hear and see me okay, Mark. Yeah, no, got you fine, Danny. So I will, I will now uh, leave uh, the, the video and the recording. So I'll hand you all over to Danny um, and, uh, and yeah, good luck, Danny. Really looking forward to seeing all this, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Mark. So welcome everyone. Uh, firstly, let me thank Mark for inviting me to talk this morning. Um, I'm Danny Singh, and I'll be talking to you about the journey so far at Weetabix to become a more inclusive business. So you may have heard of Weetabix, and hopefully you've had yours this morning. Uh, you might have even had it with baked beans after all of the things you saw yesterday. Um, the Weetabix food company not only has the UK number one cereal, cereal brand, it also has a range of cereals, cereal bars, and even a breakfast drink. Whilst the majority of our business is in the UK, we have a global reach of over 80 countries. Weetabix food company was established in 1932 in Burton Latimer, and that's where we mainly operate from today. You can see the history of our, some of our product launches on the timelines with some exciting new products launching in 2021, but today is not to talk about those. So until 2004, we were privately owned and we still retain that family-friendly feel in our culture today. When we started thinking about inclusion, the question was though, is that enough? Can you always be your true self around your family or are you constrained by their expectations and their traditions? The demographics of Weetabix are that we have a large population of straight white males. Our exec has a one to four female gender split and they are all white. The same gender split is true of our senior leaders, but we do have two people of color on our senior leadership team. Diversity is central to who we are, but we recognize that we have plenty of work to do. 
We also know that, ex that existing and prospective employees want a culture that they can be proud of and where they are free to bring their best self to work. So just to introduce, my, to introduce myself in a bit more detail and why I'm talking to you today. You can see my Weetabix history on the slide. At Weetabix, we have a successful track record of promotion and development, and I'm lucky to have benefit, benefited from that. Our female MD was promoted internally, and as well as the majority of our exec team and senior leaders. My day job is in revenue management, but I also lead on inclusion at Weetabix in the UK and represent Weetabix in our Global Diversity Council with our US sister companies. I've got leadership experience, but I don't come from a people function background. So you might be thinking, why am I talking to you about inclusion today? My ethnicity is that I have a mixed background. My mum's white, my dad's from the West Indies, from an Indian descent. I grew up in the 80s, um, and so I fall into Gen X. And joined Weetabix, I was married, um, but sadly that relationship broke down and my ex-wife and I divorced. And a few years later, I found love again, but this time was with a man. So hopefully everyone on this call has had the opportunity to be in love and you can connect with this on a human level. And if I ask you to cast your mind back to that feeling when you found love, the happiness, the excitement, emotions, and how you wanted to share it with people close to you. I remember one weekend, I took a Friday off work, flew to New York, had an amazing time, and was back in the office Monday morning. Now imagine how it feels when your colleagues ask you about your weekend and you have to lie and say that you spent it with your mates. Now my day job in revenue management has a busy agenda set in the commercial strategy, the price promotion, customer investments, and I found that hiding my sexuality had a direct impact on my capacity to do my day job. And for the first time in my career, I received negative feedback on my attitude at work. So I felt compelled that I had to come out at work. And I'm pleased to say that my experience has been completely, has been a completely positive one. And being my authentic self at work gave me back the capacity to go after the revenue management agenda. And since then we've achieved amazing success. So why is inclusion important to me? I recognise my privilege as a gay person of colour, senior leader at Weetabix, and I want to ensure there are no barriers for others to be themselves in our business. There might be a poll going into the chat to talk about privilege right now. So at Weetabix, we believe people do their best work when they can be themselves. Inclusion creates a sense of belonging to an organisation where people can innovate, challenge the status quo, feel accepted in bringing different perspectives and grow as individuals. I'm assuming that anyone that has joined this webinar today don't have to do too much convincing of the business benefit of diversity and inclusion, but the stats are pretty compelling. Multiple studies from respected, respected institutions show a close correlation between business success and those businesses that have a diverse and inclusive culture. So if we translate that into what it could mean for Weetabix, we are twice as likely to meet or exceed our financial targets, three times as likely to be high performing, six times as likely to be innovative and agile, and twice as likely to achieve better business outcomes. Amazing statistics. So let's go back to the start of our journey at Weetabix. We set up our inclusion team at the start of 2019. We we're an early adopter of the gender pay gap reporting. And whilst we we're pleased our, our gap was closing, the data highlighted other areas of gender imbalance, representation, recruitment, progression. And armed with this gender data, we began seeking feedback on experiences of other underrepresented groups at Weetabix. In those early meetings, the stories were enlightening. And with enthusiasm, we started to seek external inspiration to help our diversity issues. It was at that point we had our eureka moment. We had invited Stonewall to talk to us about how they could support us. And one of the forum, the inclusion forum members, they asked, who are Stonewall? And my response was, well, they're an LGBT plus organization. To which they said, what does LGBT mean? 
It was at that point we knew we had to rethink our approach. We were not going to make progress by concentrating on all the differences that diversity brings. The bigger prize for us, we felt, was focusing on inclusion and educating from that point. So we set our vision to have inclusion without exception. With a strategy underpinned by a number of initiatives, we embarked on engaging the senior leadership team with a roadshow across team meetings to bring inspiration to those teams, start conversations and bring inclusion onto the agenda. We knew to really make a difference, we needed more data and our maturity review surveyed every colleague to hear their thoughts and to understand where they witness and experience bias at Weetabix. In our journey looking externally, we became a major sponsor of the Grocery Aid Diversity and Grocery Network, teaming up with retailers and other suppliers. We found that this topic was bigger than just us, and every business connects on the human level with no commercial interests or competition preventing us from making a difference on inclusion. Thinking about Weetabix, one initiative that's really made a difference to us are our inclusion breakfasts. In those sessions, we invite our colleagues to tell their personal stories on when they've experienced bias. And these such powerful, authentic sessions really bring the inclusion conversation to the front of people's minds. Now we've just completed our second annual maturity review, and I'm pleased to say that every metric that we measure has moved forward positively. So we're now into action planning and building the future, and where will that take us for inclusion at Weetabix? So as I said earlier, our strategy for inclusion without exception is so that people can make a difference, make a difference at Weetabix every day. It's delivered through the four pillars that you can see on the screen, diverse thought, inclusive culture, inclusive workplace, and marketplace pride, and their activities are all listed below. And all of this is underpinned by our values, benchmarking of data, and our policies and regular comms to the teams. So just to explain inclusion leading to diversity in a bit more detail. The human beings are wonderfully complex. We're all diverse in the way we think, we act and prefer to do things. The personal details that I shared with you earlier are all inherent characteristics, things that are protected age, ethnicity, sexuality, you can see the others on the screen. But calling them out individually misses the intersectionality that often exists. Our cultural, organisational and behavioural experiences all add to building the wonderful diversity in our personalities. So how do you start to make a difference on inclusion? I guess it all starts with self-awareness. Carl Jung, a respected psych psychiatrist and psychologist said that everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. So our unconscious bias training focuses on that self-awareness, probing and asking our, how our biases impact our decisions and how we interact with each other. So I'll leave you with our vision to have inclusion without exception. We started our journey, but we, know, but we know we've got a lot to do. Some of what I've discussed today may make you feel a little comfortable and that's perfectly okay. To create change, you need to shape things up. And as human beings, that we need that sense, to, need that sense of belonging, we need to belong. And this topic we found is about hearts as much as it is about minds. It may feel difficult to start with, but we're going to make it easier for all of you. And I guess the thing is, is to think about inclusion as belonging. So think about times of, of exclusion. If you can remove the barriers and times where we feel excluded, we're one step closer to inclusion without exception. Thank you for listening to me. I'm gonna hand back over to Mark. Danny, thanks very much. Yeah, a really powerful insight, personal insight as well to your experiences of Weetabix and why you've gone on the journey that you have. So yeah, thank you so much for allowing us uh, into that. And also thank you to Weetabix for allowing us to understand 
what is again some sensitive uh, subjects and, and content Danny so yeah very grateful um as a reminder to everybody we will be doing some questions in and around it so away from the pre-selected ones that have already been asked we will be having a uh, a Q&A at the end and I am I am really keen to understand from Danny if he has actually had Weetabix with beans because I did see that this morning and um, uh, I don't know, I'm probably on the fence a little bit, but I'll be up for trying it. So um, we're going to run a couple of polls. D D Danny, do you have any insight on the Weetabix with beans while you're there? It certainly creates some interest, doesn't it? Um, I've not <laughs> tried it myself, but we did We did have a Plowman's on Weetabix once in the office. Oh, you yeah. did? Right. Surprisingly good, actually. But I, I remember seeing a, a, a green tea uh, flavoured Weetabix when I was in China once as well, which opened my eyes. So <laughs> I think the opportunity is sure. around us. Um, so thank you, Danny. Yeah, we'll speak again at the end. That's uh, that's amazing. Um, we're going to run a couple of polls now because I'm really keen to kind of gauge the um, the audience and, and and who and who we've 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 got and what what stage of your journeys you are with uh, diversity and inclusion and uh, just sort of get an understanding of the tone of, uh, of of who we've got here. So Holly uh, uh, is managing the back office, and Holly, I think you might have these polls selected to uh, to run. So we should get a poll coming up that people can answer. Here we go. So the first poll, which would be great if we could get some participation on is, where along the diversity and inclusion journey uh, do you consider your organization to be? So this is a, a nice analogy that Danny actually gave us when we were preparing for this, which is either the crawl stage, the walk stage, or do you feel that you're in full flight and you're actually running with it? So. Yeah, if everybody could take a second to vote on that, that would be really good. So have those results come through, Holly? Great. OK, so, yeah, quite powerful, really, I guess, um, with six percent of of the audience and we've we've actually had majority of people have answered so thank you um uh six percent feel that they're really in full flight and i guess we're always learning and continuing to learn but probably equal measure here that are at the crawl stage and and actually getting some uh, some strategies actually working so uh, really interesting um holly do you have the second poll we could we could run So again, if everybody would like to take a moment to, 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 uh, to select uh, their answer. So what is the reason for you attending today's webinar? So is it for a refresher, uh, for some research yourselves, um, just starting to develop your strategy um, or develop and build on your current strategies? So yeah, if everybody wouldn't mind taking a moment just to select an answer. I think probably based on the answers from the first one, this will probably show us quite a high percentage for research, I would have thought, or developing their strategies. Yeah, at any moment, we should just get the results pop up. Yeah, great. So yeah, I suppose in reverse of really what we saw before. So probably highlights that uh, that we've all had our coffee this morning and are, uh, are paying attention, which is good. So. Uh, some people here for a refresher, which is great and uh, and much needed to get some insight from other businesses, which is which is really good. Uh, research stage and developing a strategy are probably the key areas here where most of us are actually here for. Um, Holly, do you have the the next poll? Okay, so uh, these are the last two questions and and related really. Um, really interested to know if if organizations that or people with the organizations that are present if the, you actually have a diversity and inclusion lead in your business um and again uh, as a second part to this whether the dedicated dni lead is actually a full-time role for them or it's part-time and part of a sort of wider remit so i guess much like danny's um uh, journey there with weetabix and sort of taking another part of his role on that's probably clearly very important now, if you just take a moment just to select your answers and we'll run that run the uh, run the results. OK, 
Okay, uh, so we have the answers for those I think should come up. I think some people may be commenting on the chat that they're unable to put in their polls, whatever you do apologize, not sure why that may be happening. Um, Sorry, Mark, I think that might be my fault. I think because um, you have to select an answer on the second poll, um, I haven't actually put an answer in there, which is that you didn't answer yes to the first one. So apologies, that is totally my fault. Um, so I think we're going to have to take the first part of the poll without the second part. Sorry. Okay, okay. no, 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 no worries. That's, that's our fault. It would have been interesting to sort of see this and maybe... If people could put their answers in the chat function for whether you've got um, uh, somebody that uh, focuses on this and if it is part of their role or not, it'd be really interesting to find. And we can share those answers when we when we feedback and follow up with everybody. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to introduce uh, Tash to the uh, to the webinar. So uh, Tasha Broomfield. Um, uh, sorry, this is now flashed up again. I'm just going to get rid of it. Uh, so, hi, Tash. I think we can see you. You may be muted, though. How are Hello, you? Can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah. So, 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 so Tash comes from a very different um, angle, really, from in terms of industry. So, working with Mills and Reeve, um, uh, one of the top law firms, and obviously a very different organisation to Weetabix, but have clearly identified the same um, uh, the same um, uh, aspects of what is needed. But Tash is actually a lead in in the position that she does. So, this isn't part of your role, Tash. I understand this is actually everything that you do and focus right. on. you do lots of other things in the background as well away yeah. some roof so i will i will now hand you over to natasha to to talk through her content so tash i will speak to you soon okay all right thank you hi everybody as mark said i am natasha broomfield reed and i'm the diversity inclusion and well-being manager at mills and reed and it's really interesting actually to see that poll around having do you have a dni and well-being needs and i gen i genuinely feel that you know embedding diversity and equity is everybody's responsibility but I think when you have a driver you have a DNI lead within the organization it will help you to accelerate to drive to coordinate to structure to do some of the things we're going to talk about today so I know a lot of organizations even at Mills and Reed there was work that was taking place before I started but I think having somebody in place ha helps you to take action and drive it forward like I said but not forgetting that the fact that you need um, um, uh, everybody to understand just as you've got a DNI lead, it's not their job. Like Danny said, Danny isn't, hasn't got a DNI lead, but he's very involved and he is a driver in addressing diversity and inclusion. So that was really interesting to see. Also interesting to see around where you're at in, 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 in your stage of diversity. And I will always say, you know, whatever stage you're at, diversity and inclusion is never over. There is always more to do. There are always more emerging issues that are going to come through with that. So, you know, we, whatever stage you're at, there'll be something for the next three years, five years moving forward. So, you know, it's never done. If we thought it was done, you know, there's something wrong with us. Um, and just to give you a little bit about MNR, as um, Mark said, we are a national law firm with six offices across the UK. We have to, even though we're a, a UK law firm, we do have an, a global reach and we have partners and we do do international work as well. I came into post in April 2019 and I have a background of diversity and inclusion, ooh, probably about 20 years on and off, but in different areas. So I held roles of head of DNI in um, a national organisation. I held the previous organisation to this. I was head of development for a DNI global consultancy, and I've done roles that are partially diverse inclusion. And like I said, those two that are particularly that was a full time role. And I also have uh, do consultancy work as well as working at MNR as well in my in my role. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. What we're going to be talking about today is our journey at Mills and Reeve. And like I said, I've only been here not quite two years yet, so it's going to be two years in April. That goes very very quickly. And like I said, I've still got how many activities that need doing. And when I started at MNR, um, like I said, it was really, really positive. I don't know if many people know about the law firm, but we are very much known as being a very inclusive and supportive organisation anyway, because sometimes law firms can have a negative rap in terms of driving hard and not being supportive. But MNR, the culture is what we're actually known for. And it is true. When I came to the firm, I was like, is it really like that? And it is, I will say, because I was like, wow, I'm going to check. But it is, it really is very much an inclusive organisation. We want to support, you know, our clients, our employees, 
our staff and partners, everybody to make sure, like Danny said, that they can be themselves and they can be themselves at work. And like Danny also mentioned, Stonewall and have that mantra, people perform better when they can be themselves. And we want that for everybody as well at Mills and Reeve. And when I started, there were already some um, activities already in place. They, were all, they already had strategies, so I didn't have to go in and develop something. What was really positive is that they already had some workforce and inclusion priorities and goals that the firm wanted to address. And there were the, these sort of, there's lots of work that's going on under these three headings, but these are three sort of priorities that we looked at. And one was around looking at our workforce. You know, as in many, many organisations and many firms, we know that we, there is very much more to do in terms of enhancing the diversity of our teams, of our lawyers, of our business support teams. And, you know, with in particular across all, you know, across the legal sector, we know particularly for Black, Asian and minority ethnic, we need to do more. We know we need to do more in terms of social mobility, often people from lower social and economic groups, put my teeth in and don't often get the opportunity to go into law and also gender was a big issue for us as well as looking more wider at disability and lgbt plus two so the main thing for us is what you know and i'll mention this later is looking at the data that we had what's it telling us so you know we know you know that you know there's a lot and the law society have done some recent reports that support this and are giving tools and techniques for people to do it so you know one thing we did was with very much a workforce um, look at workforce and what it looks like now so it gives us a benchmark what we can then look at in the next coming years to enhance that and we also started to look at you know how is equality, equality diverse inclusion you know embedded in our daily practices in our processes in our you know when we're doing um, work do we look at analysis um, all sorts of things is how is it embedded how is it addressed within all functions of business whether it's for um, staff and partners or whether it's for um, our clients and also celebrate like Danny said again it's really about celebrating everyone's difference when like I said in that slide when you had you know look what could encompass us and look at intersectionality we want to make sure that everybody's celebrated whoever you are and then we promote that celebration across the firm and externally so we want to do much more about okay whoever you are you supported but also what we can do um, externally as well, because we want to give that message that this is a good place to work and whoever you are, we will support you and provide, remove any barriers so you can be your, your best self. So they're the three things that when I came into the firm, there were already these targets that were set and various activities that were in there. And the first thing I did when I came is do a sort of audit of what was taking place. So, one of the first things I did, for example, I'm not going to go, into, I'm not going to my whole work life, but in terms of recruitment, I looked at, you know, if we're looking at our workforce goals, what is the recruitment cycle looking like? So what we did is right from the beginning, I looked at the recruitment cycle, I had a little circle, you know, from advert attraction to interview to induction, whole process. What's it look like at m and and what can we do? How, are there any gaps? So we, we recognise that we could do more probably in terms of, you know, you talked, Danny again talked about bias and making sure that we've got structures in place to try and eliminate and reduce bias. What could we do where we reaching out to current underrepresented communities? Can we look differently at how we um, recruit? Can we look differently when we're working with recruitment agencies? We've been, I mean, this is work has been going on for about a year or so and it's, it is ongoing. And we just really need to look at how we can engage more people we had we did birth a bursary so we had a bursary uh, last year for a black asian multi-ethnic person who's interested in law we're going to carry that carry on those bursaries and also develop those into for other underrepresented groups as well and so you know that is one thing we looked at the recruitment is big a big big piece of my activity and as it continued to be other things we looked at when we looked at disability for example i'm just giving you sort of highlights of some of the work we did is looking at, you know, what's it like if you are a um, employee who's disabled? Have you got the reasonable adjustments? What's the structure like? Because M&R were brilliant in terms of if someone has a need, absolutely they get supported. But part of what my work was in terms of how I started was, okay, how is it happening across all offices? Are we all doing it similarly and putting the instructions in place? For example, you know, we've implemented an adjustments process for disability for mental health and the menopause as well so we were thinking you know how can we do that so there you know a couple of things that we've done in terms of policy but I looked at the whole structure of policy 
um, in terms of um, all our procedures. I also look at well-being. So well-being was also part of my work, looking at how we address well-being in the workplace as well. And very much, I've got a much greater uh, uh, focus on client experience. When I first started, look very much internally, but now we're doing a lot more on what is a client experience from start to finish when people engage with m &R. Whoever you are, are you communicating the way that people want to communicate with you? Are you giving them the right support in, in terms of that as well? So that's what I did. So pretty much I've been doing and continue to do audits on practice, on procedure, what's working. We also already do lessons learned in terms of what um, is working and what not, because we can't rest on our laurels and go, well, we've done this, that's really good. We can't do that at all, so we make sure that we look. At, we do that. With over the last year and a half since I've been at the firm, we've also actually um, developed additional or um, had additional network groups. The Spectrum was the RLGBT plus network, and that was very much um, in uh, place before I got there. Very active, but I thought well, we need other we need other focuses as well. So what we have got now, we've got um, a um, reach network, which is our race, if ethnic um, an ethnic minority and cultural heritage network. And we have ability, which is our um, disability network. And we will be rolling out this year, a parent and carer network as well. But those three, you've got those logos. They're the ones that we have currently in place. And we've got really excellent chairs and co-chairs who were in this network. And part of it was to think about what we could do, what the networks could do. We work together, but also support each other to achieve those priorities and those goals that you saw in those last slides. How can everybody get involved in making us even more inclusive? If you're LGBT+, plus, can you be yourself? If you're disabled, can you be yourself? If you're Black, Asian, Muslim, ethnic, can you be yourself? Do you have to feel you need to be somebody else, you know, to fit in in the workplace? Because like we say, where there's underrepresentation, some people may feel, I actually don't think I can be myself because there's not many people that look like me. So though with all those networks and I work really closely together in terms of embedding the strategy and addressing what needs to be done to make us an even better place to work. So if anybody out there hasn't got network groups, you know, I would recommend that you do that. But what I would say is make sure you have um, terms of reference, make sure there's a government's pro governance process, because in my experience, sometimes when you haven't got that in place and this sort of and they're sort of off doing their own things, it doesn't always work. It needs to work with a strategy. It needs to work with if you have somebody leading on DNI, even if you've got a committee or a working group, it needs to work together. So you're actually working towards those same goals. A big thing we've been doing over the last um, year, year and a half, is really enhancing learning and making sure that it's continuous. We are continuously providing awareness and knowledge around a whole range of issues um, to support everybody. So everybody can, you know, we know that, you know, everybody's in a different place when it comes to diversity and inclusion. We know, you know, for example, you might have been in a, brought up in an environment where you were brought up in a really diverse world and everybody around you was really diverse, a real diverse community. And yet some others might be in a real rural, rural area and not had been exposed to that great diversity. So we know that the more we get to know, the more we know about wider communities, the more informed we are. So we've got a continuous process of learning, not just, oh, by the way, we've done a, I've done a diversity inclusion course when I first started and then five years later, nothing's done. So we've done very much about, you know, ongoing learning and doing it in different ways. So yes, we have some email and yes, we have facilitated learning. We'd have lunch and learns. And we've done some, we do panel events and we've done a, a range on a whole range of issues around um, um, being Black, Asian, Marginal Ethnic and mental health, being LGBT and Black, Asian, Marginal Ethnic. We've got some events coming up next week around trans, non-binary and um, being bi. Um, we constantly are constantly thinking we've done awareness on webinar men's issues so we're constantly trying to think okay and we also ask people let us know if there's anything that we're not doing so I would say when you're doing your learning and awareness and really ongoing because that's what's going to support inclusion that's where people are going to go oh I never really understood that now I get that and they'll be more willing to go yeah I hear what you're saying I'll get your point other things we've been doing is very much which li links into the learning is around sharing lived experiences. So we've been doing this as part of our learning awareness, but also similar to what um, Danny mentioned, actually, I can't remember what he called them, but we have them called spotlights or on the sofas events. So we've got people who share their lived experiences of what it's like to be who they are. So we've had lots of different people sharing their stories. 
whether it's what's like to be black and all mixed race in the UK, what's it like to be gay, what's all those things that maybe if you've not lived in those shoes, you've not got that full understanding. So we've done a lot of those, we continue to do a lot of those events and we're so well attended because like I say, the more we know, knowledge is power, so they say, so the more we know, the more we keep informed that it's really great for everybody. And like we do those, record them so they're not lost and then everybody can have access to those if they're not able to, to visit view at that time. But we've got so much engagement for those because you can't beat a lived experience story. You can't beat somebody saying, you know what, this is how I, this is how I live my, you know, this is how the walk, walking, you know, in my shoes. So we found that really, really powerful in terms of lived experiences. So I would say that I'm going to put a little warning sign on there to say, you know, this is where people have come forward to share their experiences and willingly without being, you know, forced in any way. Because I have worked with organisers sometimes and I feel I'm the only person of colour or I'm the only LGBT person and I keep getting asked for my lived experience and I'm not willing to do that. So what I would say is that it's, you know, if you are doing that shared lived experience, which is really, really powerful, make sure that those people are willing to do it. We're not saying to them, you know, come forward and um, they're not going to feel they've got a choice in that matter, but they're really, really powerful. And I'm consistently and ongoingly, you know, looking at developing policies and procedures, whether it's IEDR policy, whether it's line management guidance, whether it's recruitment processes, we are constantly reviewing what we are doing to be more inclusive and be diverse in all our practice. Other things that we have in the firm, which I some of I brought in, some um, I've developed, some of there before I got there. But we have well-being supporters and champions, and we know that you know even though not all DNI roles have well-being in, because of particularly the pandemic and how issues have been, you know, the issues around that well-being has very much been, uh, you know, a key a key focus. Because even if it wasn't in your role, I suppose my, most DNI people would have to consider that because mental health comes across that even inclusion because for a lot of people you know I don't know if people have read the research but you know that actually working from home for a lot of people has made it made us be more inclusive more allow allowable flexible working adjustments for those people who need to, wanted to work from home so actually it's really really important but we have our well-being supports and champions most people I'm sure on here would have an EAP we have paternity and maternity mentors this is what before I came in we really encourage flexible working. I've told you about the networks and the parents and carers. And what we have is our governance structure. We have our D um, diverse inclusion and wellbeing steering group, which is headed up by our managing partner. So that's, we feel it's really important because it's headed up by managing partner, has a lot of senior people on that group. And that's what you need. You need to make sure that uh, you've got the right people around the table who can make, help you drive it forward and help you make decisions. And we've got a health and safety committee, which also um, um, crosses over into some of, some of the wellbeing work as well. When I first came to the firm, I was very much about, um, I'm not going to join these charters unless we're doing it properly, because I know that sometimes people would sign up to a charter or put a little rainbow you know, logo but I'm very much about we only are doing it if we're doing the work. So I would say to you, these are um, campaigns and organisations we're joined up to, but we are very much doing the work behind it. And for me, I can, I mean, I'd be like, I'm not, we're not doing it unless we're doing the work. I'd be like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking the shame of how, uh, not, you know, somebody saying what are you doing, we couldn't prove it. So I'd say do them, but make sure you are doing the work that embeds that work to make you more inclusive. So the race of chart worker charter looks at how you are embedding inclusion in terms of race so for example do you do ethnicity pay gap which we do do you have a senior sponsor in terms of the, um, uh, race we do so all the things we were doing but it just gives that message of race is important to us as a firm okay social mobility that's something i'd say over the last year or so we've had a lot more focus on and we're very much committed to providing opportunities and we work with people like social mobility foundation and other organizations to make sure that everybody's getting opportunity and it's not mini me's and all the same people working at the firm. we want to stretch that as much as possible as i said we really um are happy to talk about flexible working business disability forum is one of our uh, memberships and we've like said, we've done a lot of work on making sure whether it's visible um, or not easily visible disabilities do you get that support in place if you look at our website you'll see some stories of our colleagues who have shared their experience of the support they've got at MNR for those who are disabled Danny mentioned Stonewall you know again you know LGBT uh, uh, inclusion 
we know there's still people who feel they can't be themselves in the workplace. So, you know, working to enhance all our practices, practices around LGBT inclusion and intersectionality within that is really important. And a more recent one is the Mindful Business Charter. And we've joined the Mindful Business Charter because, I mean, this is before COVID, but it just highlighted that there was such a need for it. Again, m and are brilliant in terms of their support to people, but we need to give the message externally to our clients that we are maybe working flexibly. We may have to, you know, um, we are look, making sure we look after each other and we adhere to the principles of that so that people do have that work-life balance. And we're not saying there's gonna be times where everybody's working really hard and we, you know, we have to sort of hit the ground running. That's life. But generally we wanna make sure that we have that well-being, that my own no, work-life balance in place for everybody. And that will allow you to, you know, we know, I mean, Danny mentioned at the beginning, the research that shows if you've got a really good inclusive organisation, really good practices, you're going to have more loyalty, you're going to be more productive, people are going to stay. And this is why we sign up to these. We want to continually see how we enhance what we're doing. And that's really important to us. And uh, people, people have probably heard this saying, it's similar to, again, Danny was mentioned about growth and belonging. And I love this saying because it's around, you know, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance and belonging is dancing like nobody's watching. So it's really important. We would love everybody in m and to feel like they have it, there is inclusion and belonging, you know, and belonging, making sure that that's the support is there, um, you know, whoever you are. And also the psychological safety. This, this is something that we're constantly working on in terms of inclusion making sure that people can speak up, they can ha have speak up without fear of reproach and that they can do that confidentially through a series of um, ways. And interestingly, as well as our, um, you know, on the sofa events and spotlights, so we've also been doing sort of I'm listening sessions, particularly after um, the death of George Floyd, we had sessions where people could go, this is my story, this is how I'm feeling, this is what, you know, so people also had had opportunity to share those views without any um, free of reproach of, of any comeback from that. They just wanted to share their, their personal experience. And I can't tell you how powerful those sessions were. Coming to the end now of um, my presentation, I know we're going to have some questions as well. But some of the things I've mentioned, but if I could put all top tips in a little one pager, this is what I think we should be doing. So audit, audit, audit. How are you going to know where you are at okay until you know where you are whether you know some of you said you were walking crawling you're running so whatever stage you are whether you are walking see where you are so audit all your practices so that'd be things around recruitment selection leadership procurement um uh, engagement um well-being accessibility so you could look at whole there's a whole range culture and I would look at all those areas. What are you doing now and what does it look like? If you're doing that really well, that is going to give you a whole range of activities and recommendations that you can then move forward and actually address. But to me, you need to know where, where you are. You need to look at your data. I've got it later on down the line, but you need to look at data to make sure that what it's telling you now, have you got a baseline of information that you can then review? But also when you're looking at data, have you got the right categories? Because I found that even when I came to MNR, we had to review and enhance and update the categories that we're using. Is it an inclusive um, monitoring data form? Is it telling you what you need to know? So making sure that you have that data is really important. You've got all the information that, that helps you to see where you're at. And like I said, no matter what stage you're at, education and learning, and like I said, continuous learning. So it's not just about, oh, we've done one session. Got to have senior leadership buy-in because if you don't, you're gonna find it harder to accelerate and drive forward. I'm not saying you can't get anything done, but you really do need that senior leadership buy-in. We've just talked about um, psychological safety and longing, along it, inclusion and belonging. So making sure that you do have those safe spaces that people can discuss things, but also having more than one space. Just having one way of letting people share experiences is not enough. You need to find different processes because we all like to do things differently and we may not all feel we want to share in that one way. Ensure inclusion, diversity, and equity and accessibility is on the agenda. So make sure that um, wherever, wherever meetings you're at, um, that you bring on, whether it's senior management, whether it's uh, on your in your networks, all those areas, make sure that you are, it's on the agenda. Um, even if it's, and I would say when it's on the agenda, make sure that it is uh, meaningful 
because sometimes we work with organizations they'll go oh yeah we put this on the we put it on the agenda but what's it telling you make sure when you've got it on the agenda is you're relating to either your goals your priorities making things better not just oh we've got it on the we've got it on the agenda but we've got nothing to talk to it make sure it links to your business your priorities your goals enhancing your practice we've talked about collecting and use data use it to inform practice don't just do it and don't do anything with it and that's why a lot of organizations have had um, negative um, feedback the fact that they've gone well why am I giving you my information because you've done nothing with it so you need some really good comms on the on the importance of why you're collecting that data also what what you're doing with it so let people know periodically so this is what you told us this is what you did do that periodically okay and then more you know importantly is around making sure you monitor and review what you're doing and making sure that you do that so keep making keeping in touch and making sure that there are periods where you are double checking as it worked lessons learned and moving forward on that okay so there's some very overarching quick top tips and i am going to end there because i can see these questions coming in i'm going to stop sharing so i hope you found i know this is a whistle stop tour we've talked about today that's my whistle top tour back over to you mark thank you for that Tash, amazing. Thanks very much. And and yeah, certainly a, a few questions that have come in uh, off the back of that, but a, re a really good discussion there and insight into the business and how you've gone about what you've done. So I think some of the key things and sort of takeaways that I've taken from both really is that, uh, and I think Tash, you might have started by saying this, you know, this journey's never completed. And I think, you know, we're, we're going to be continually learning here and there's going to be other things that we need to ultimately be listening to, which is a key part of, um, of, of what we need to be doing with any strategies is listening to our businesses. Um, Allowing a culture for people to be themselves, you know, a really key part that I know in terms of Danny's story here about uh, about himself personally, which was uh, which was really good. Um, I guess sort of hit home actually quite quite hard that you understand that sort of people have their own personal experiences here, and actually they get an opportunity to be the best versions of themselves. The thought that somebody can't be themselves at work um, is uh, yeah, it's 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 really it's really tough to comprehend. Um, and with that, the key functions are you're going to get more productivity out of that individual and also retention. And working for a recruitment business in this marketplace, retaining your talent is going to be really important and crucial to any 2021 strategy. Um, you know, in the marketplace that we find ourselves today, um, you really want to keep hold of the best talent that you have in the organization. So um, uh, our responsibilities as a recruiter, um, uh, again, have been, have, been, have been pretty vast. So we are asked by clients more and more now than we ever have been about our own personal responsibilities as a business. You know, how do we go about sourcing candidates? You know, are the shortlists that clients are going to be receiving, are they as inclusive as they can be? So we do, do go through training ourselves with our consultants about unconscious bias writing adverts that, again, uh, have a good equal measure of both masculine and feminine words, so all these things can have an impact. So we're, we're, we're as aware of this topic as anybody else, both of us are a key employer uh, in the local area uh, and making sure that we have the right sort of policies and procedures in place, but also representing our clients. So, um, uh, and, and, and I guess the, the, the last thing that I really wanted to, um, uh, to sort of highlight on is, is probably really the follow-up that we'll do from here before going into the Q&A. So there's been some people asked on the chat function, you know, will we, will we supply the slides? Yes, we, we will get that over in a PDF format. Yes, both speakers, Tash and Danny, are happy for that to happen. We'll also have a recording of today as well, so you can sort of revisit this as and when you need to. And in addition to that, I will put on a link to, because um, clearly there's uh, everybody in the room is here to listen to diversity and inclusion and the topic. We, we This is a second in a series individually about that topic. So uh, we had uh, Emma from Smith Client talking about their engineering uh, and actually some of their early years development recruitment and how they went about um, uh, increasing the uh, diversity and inclusion when, when going through their graduate recruitment scheme. So going from uh, almost 100% male intake to now leveling it off 50-50. So I think there could be some interest there from everybody and we'll make sure that's shared. Now, it would be great to welcome both Tash and Danny back. Um, welcome both, thank you, Anne. So, um, so yeah, I thought it'd be sensible to go through some of the questions and actually, um, a couple of them, uh, and I really want to get through as many as we can. So apologies to anyone if we don't get to your question, we really will try. Uh, first one that I've got here in the Q&A from the pre-selected ones is talking about early careers and recruitment strategy for DNI. So if I send out the 
uh, this link from our previous webinar that can really help with that. And I think that may focus on that question. So one of the questions it does talk to about here, which Tash, you've touched on in your top tips as well, is how to get senior management buy-in. Um, you, you, you identified the relevance there. Of course, it's crucial. And things around productivity and retention could be one of the key drivers. But again, you know, do you have any comment there for mm -hmm. a question we've had about how to get senior management to buy-in? I think, you know, for all senior management, you know, we've got Danny on, but you know that you have to make sure they understand the benefits. So for some people, the moral, you know, the moral, um, uh, you know, people say the moral, morality of them, you know, the moral case of diversity, it's the right thing to do. We should be doing it. If we're reaching, uh, you know, where it's customers, clients, wanting to get the best talent, we should be doing that, you know, as a moral um, issue. But some other, lean, you know, senior managers might need a little bit of coaching, <laughs> a little bit of coaching to get on the old case. So in that case, I would do things around like the business case. How is it going to make you better? Both Danny and I mentioned, if you give them the hard lines, this is going to help you. They'd be silly to think, well, actually, I don't want to be the best at what I can be and the yeah. most productive financially. People also talk about the financial return on investment as well on, on diversity, for example, and inclusion. So that you know get them on board to understand how it's going to benefit you make you better and always say as well even if you get one or two leaders on board then it will grow so sometimes you're like you're not going to get the all of the board all the senior management initially going yeah this is brilliant start even if you get one or two start with those one or two have those discussions think about you know how you can get them on board may might, might want to pilot something do something to evidence what you're doing and then others will hopefully come on board as well. And I think also have KPI. So as well as doing it, make sure you've got targets. So you're not just doing it. And also there should be targets should be reported to board, to leadership, and they should be involved in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Danny, anything to add from your perspective? Um, I think Tash has described it really well. I think it, you know, for me, it's about... Um, providing data. I think there's a question a bit later on, it talks about some of the barriers that we faced. Um, I've had the luxury of reading the questions whilst <laughs> Tasha's talking. Um, talk about barriers and I guess for us one of the things we found was it's you know that business case, creating a business tangible business benefit as, as Tasha just described and then it's helping our senior leaders understand their bias. You know, some of the early conversations we had with our senior leadership team is well, I don't experience bias at Weetabix. You know, are you, are you not just creating a are you not just creating a problem out of by raising and talking about this subject? Yeah. Um, you know, and helping people understand their bias, bringing data to the table. Um, so our maturity review that I touched on earlier, I think there's another question about that later on. Our maturity review surveys everyone in our business and it's voluntary, but the response is overwhelming. You know, in like the call today. Um, so many people want to you know, volunteer their their um, their experience and their views on this topic. This is, you know, like, as I said, this is touching on the human beings of us. This is we want to belong, we want to belong to the place we work at. So if you've got the opportunity to contribute to that, um, people people really feed in and give their views, and that data is then really powerful to use of our senior leadership team to to make a change and get get them to engage in this topic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I can imagine as well a, a phrase that some people may hear quite frequently is that, well, we don't we don't have any bias. We just recruit the right people for the right roles. You know, we're, 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 we're inclusive. We can't be anything but inclusive because we do that. So I think probably educating as to why that's not the answer is is, is probably a first starting point as well. Um, and actually, from a recruitment perspective, we've got a much more discerning audience now that are applying to jobs. So We've, we've, um, this is the future of talent that's coming through from universities through into graduate positions. They're starting to want to know what is what is your well-being strategy? You know, what is your diversity and inclusion strategy as an organisation? And these types of questions from candidates have never come up before. So this is a full generational shift now and the future of, of, of everybody's organisations and the talent coming in. Um, so uh, moving on to another one then. So uh, in an already diverse workforce, how would you suggest um, underrepresented groups are heard, i.e. I LGBTQ uh, plus? Tasha, you might, you might have more detail on this than us. Okay. I mean, that, that, that was a problem we faced at the beginning is, um, you know, as I described in our story and our journey, 
uh, the, the level of awareness and understanding of these groups wasn't there. So we had to start with you know, just bringing inclusion onto the agenda, helping people understand what it means, why it's important, what does it mean for you, what does it mean for the business, that, that was our start point before we went down the route of um, picking out specific groups to, um, you know, to support and you know, allyship and all those, all of the great, great work that we'll, we'll move on to in the future. Um, but that was the nature of our business and where it was. Um, so we've not done anything around um, you know, resort, employee resource groups to, to support at this stage, but that would be in our future journey. Um, and I think it's similar sort of what I said before in terms of if you didn't have oh if you didn't have a network having channels so what could what space could you give to people in the LGBTQI community if they did want to share because sometimes when you're in rep underrepresented you might think well I don't want to say that you know I don't feel I can be myself so give a range of um, places that people can be themselves someone they trust and they can confide, confide in having like might have like one or two nominated people. I also think in terms of having a network would be really, really useful. And even if it's one or two people, I've worked in organisations where you've started with sort of two people and then within a couple of years, you've got 70, you know, you've got how many people yeah. on board? So even if you've got one or two people who from, because you usually find whatever um, network or underrepresentation that you're looking at, there's always somebody there who's really passionate, really um, committed and really enthusiastic about being heard and sharing those issues. You can start, just start small. It could be two or three people sitting in a room and starting that discussion and it will just grow. I think about our reach network has only been in place, well, just over a year. And I think we probably started with like seven. Now there's probably like how many, gosh, how many people? We have probably like 50 people join a lot of me, you know, so it, it will grow and events you'll get hundred plus. So it just shows you that, you know, a couple of people can start that and you get other people then coming on and go, oh, I'm interested. And like Danny said, it might be as an ally as well. An ally, I'm very much, I'm glad you mentioned that Danny because I meant to say it and I forgot. <laughs> In terms of allyship is really important. You don't necessarily have to be from that community, but as long as you're willing to support, you know, never no campaigning got anywhere with just the people from that community. Allyship helps drive it and helps you be successful. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and next question, I think uh, you might have touched on this one, actually, Ash. Um, uh, this is more collating the data initially to find out, you know, what, what, what the what employees. Mm. Are thinking. But this is uh, how do you use data to support the strategy and how so? Um, yeah, mm. no, you touched on it, but uh, yeah, if you could, anything else you yeah. might add? Anything. So it could be, for example, I mean, day to day to data. You could look at if you're looking at recruitment, you could look at data in terms of who's applying, who's getting the job, who, you know, who's being shortlisted. You can look at data in terms of who's getting promoted, who's getting those opportunities. You could do data at who's engaging as a client or customer. So you can do on a number of things, but that data will tell you, for example, if the data told you you're recruiting and only the same sort of people are getting through, you think, mm, maybe we need to change something, what we're doing. If the development is doing needs changing, for example, MR, which also didn't mention, we've done a lot of scrutiny in terms of like women we've got to try we've done really well in getting more female partners for example upon the you know and we did that by scrutinizing so as well as like looking at that we looked at the data and like oh we need you know there's something going on here and we have a like scrutiny we check we think oh, what is that person been missed so putting in processes so any you know data you know even if you've got haven't got wholesome data it will still tell you something you know and i think yeah. and you will build on that because as we know it could take years to get you know your, your, your wholesome data that you're going to get you know the 80s and 90s percent of everybody completing their data so you can still do something even with a small amount of data see what it's telling you and stop consistently keep checking it and keep seeing how you can enhance what you're doing thanks sash uh, well, I, you know, i'd say businesses run on data it's, mm. the, it's the languages it's the language that senior leadership and you know line managers they understand Definitely. you know my Definitely. background's in finance before my current job. Um, you know, that, what, where would you be as a business if you didn't know what your financial performance was? That's all data, right? So exactly. Um, you know, making that transparent that people in a way that people can consume uh, easily and understand just you know hits home. It, it makes yeah. the difference. So Definitely. anything as, as Tash described, any data you can get, even if it's not complete, it will paint a picture of where you are and where you need to get to yeah thanks danny 
Uh, so another one here about senior leadership team from, from Joe Ward today. So we've probably gone some way to answer that. Um, uh, what would you recommend for smaller organisations where people may be hesitant uh, to share more about themselves? Um, this might be a harder question to ask, be it the fact that both of your organisations are, um, are probably larger than a typical sort of SME, talking sort of 50 people. Yeah. So, any, I think, oh, any sorry. Tips for those types of businesses? Got all excited there. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's about the communications and keeping it going because with you, we know with all this, even if you, and I'm sure even in MNR, we constantly tell people we want to hear your story, we're inclusive, but we know there's going to be people who may like, well, I'm not quite sure yet. Let me see what else they're doing first before I come forward. So I think in a small organisation is just keep the comms going because somebody might not come up with you the first time, the second time, might be the fifth time you've said, don't forget, you know, we need to raise this information. So for me, it's about how big or small communications. And again, having a nominated person or persons, some people have employee reps or people whose role is into be com that confidant um, if rather than having... Um, a, um, a wider, you know, EAP, whatever. So I would say keep the comms coming because that those people, whoever they are in whatever small group need to know that, yes, I can be heard. Thanks, Tash. Um, just, there's another couple here, which we may have, yeah, got time. I'd say you've got time for, for one more, I'd say. So apologies to those that might have got their question up to personally. Um, uh, yeah, different question here. So hi, uh, how do any of the speakers have any advice on measuring success and the impact of well-being or diversity and inclusion initiatives? Um, and that's from Christina. I mean, do you want to go, Danny? Go, Danny, go, go. You're about to speak, is all right? No. <laughs> I was, <laughs> was going to say, say around the same, same thing I mentioned earlier. So I'll, we do an annual maturity review. So that asks around what's your opinion on the level of inclusion at Weetabix? How, how have you experienced or witnessed bias? And we give the categories for that. So we'll go into age, gender, sexuality, all those are listed out um, as well as other questions. So we get a breadth of understanding. We then follow that up with focus groups. So, you know, it's great quantitative data from the survey results. And, and, and just by the way, we, you know, we, we run a normal annual people survey and the level of engagement we get out of our inclusion survey is incredible. The responses come back within a couple of days and this is you know, the majority of our, you know, our colleagues want to feed in their thoughts. So it just shows how powerful that is. Um, we ask them to give their demographics, but not their name. Um, but they, you know, they, they can add that through the comments if they want to. And then the focus groups delve into some of the detail in a bit more deep a bit of the feedback in a bit more detail. Um, so, you know, it's it's through that we measure our performance. We, we do it once a year, but that's that gives us our um, stake in the ground to understand how we're progressing. Thank you, Danny. Tash, anything to, anything to add there? Same, and I think what we, and I think don't hold back if you have to do more of them, because exactly, I agree 100% what Danny said, but also particularly through COVID, for example, we've done more on that. And we've asked like particularly around wellbeing, done regular pulse surveys, anything changed, we've done it not, we've done it across the firm, but also by in a team teams as well. Because sometimes people might say, you know, to a whole wider firm, oh, this is how we're doing, but they might say something different and tell their team more directly. So do the wider um, engagement surveys around wellbeing, but also in terms of them. We'd ask things in that as well about, have you got the adjustments you need and all that sort of stuff. So surveys I find are really useful. Focus groups were always brilliant. But I'd say do it in a couple of ways. So you might want to do it in your team to see the type team dynamics, they might be willing to say, but also as well as the um, organisational one. Thanks, Tash. Uh, so very conscious of time. Um, and, um, and yeah, just wanted to take a second just to say thank you to everybody for today. Uh, really, um, yeah, re re really powerful uh, stories that you've given between the two of you, really, Danny, on a very personal insight. So I'd like to thank you both, Tash and Danny, as speakers, you know, giving your journeys and, um, and also to Mills and Reeve and Weetabix to allowing us an insight there, which can be a uh, yeah, which is a really honest insight from both 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 of you. So, um, uh, there's uh, there will be an opportunity where I'll send out the follow up, so people can get an opportunity to feedback, which we would love to get, so we can shape this around any content that people would like. 
And, um, and yeah, just wanted to thank everybody again for attending today, for giving up your time. We'll get the fo follow-up sent out as soon as we can do. And again, once again, to Tash and to Danny, thank you very much for today.